Doesn't it feel good in here? Amen. Don't you feel better, Brother Tim, than you did when you got here? That's, what, that's one of the things that church is all about. I want to walk out every Sunday not only feeling different, but being different than I walked in. If you would, turn with me to the book of Genesis. I know it's hard to find. Genesis chapter 1, that's even harder to find. In verse 27... It says, so God created man in his own image. Can you say in his own image? In his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. You may be seated. In chapter 2, verse 7, I want to go back to that verse. He created Adam in his own image. And Hawa, who was Eve, that's the original pronunciation of Eve. He, he created Adam and Hawa in his image. On to chapter 2, verse 7. Where did chapter 2 go? There it is. In the Lord, these numbers, man, they really get to me. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Not only was he made in God's image by the hand of God from the dust of the ground, but he breathed into him and he became a living soul. In chapter 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard a voice, and this is Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, said, And they heard a voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Whenever they were created, they were created different than we are. You, you've got to understand, and I, I hear, hear the songs on the radio, on Christian radio, that, that Jesus is the only Son of God. That is not true. Adam, Adam was a son of God as well. And a son of God is a son or daughter of God is exactly what every one of us should aspire to be. Jesus is the only begotten, the only born son of God. Whenever I was born, I was not in the image of God. I was formed in sin, shaping in iniquity. The visage of, of this man was marred by the sin nature that was passed down from Adam to us. But when Adam was created, he, he was created in it. You're gonna, a lot of you may disagree with what I'm about to say, but you can, I'm going to prove it to you. Matter of fact, I'm going to challenge a lot of your theology all the way through this message, and it won't be long today. I won't keep you long. But Adam was created in a glorified state. He was glorified. As a matter of fact, Adam and Eve were so glorified that God didn't even want them covered up. They walked naked in the garden and they had no shame. Why? Because they had no shame to have. There was no sin that had entered into their life. And so there was nothing to be ashamed of. And they were glorified. As a matter of fact, and, and I know you going on to Exodus, you can read about Moses whenever he wanted to look upon God, and God said, hey, if you look upon me, if you see me, you look upon me, it'll kill you. Anybody who looks upon the face of God, you'll die. But Adam and Eve were able to walk in the cool of the day with God. You say, well, I don't believe that, that they were in a glorified state. Well, Moses was not able to walk with him or he would die. But Adam and Eve were. It's because they were in a glorified state of being. So, before sin entered into their lives, they were living glorified. My, my title today is Programmed for Glory. They were glorified. What does glorified mean? There are some adjectives that describe glorified. Now, we use the word glory 
or glorified a lot in Christianity, or we should, because it's, it's a big part of Christianity. All right, but what does it really mean? It's kind of like a lot of you may not have known what amen means. But what glorified means, it means elevated. It means special. It means majestic, splendorous, or exalted. And Adam was made in the glorified image of God. He was made to be glorified. Can you say amen? You believe that Adam was made to exude God's glory. It's no wonder, being the descendants of Adam, it is no wonder that we spend much of our lives trying to be glorified, right? There's like $11.8 billion spent in the United States last year on plastic surgery procedures. Hey, if that's your thing, I'm not preaching against that. You do you. Just, uh, I don't know. But that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to want to be glorified. We, we watch sports, and I've got nothing against sports. I love sports. I'm going to go uh, probably beat uh, Luke and LB here in a little bit in some sports so I can be glorified. But you ever see a champion win at a sport? They're like, whoa, look at me. Look at this big old trophy I've got. Look at this. It glorifies man. Mercedes Benz makes a lot of money glorifying people or attempting to. We, the bigger the house, the bigger the check, the, the more important the position, it's all about glorifying us. And we can't really help it. Not within ourselves. But we're programmed that way. That's the reason that without God, we can't break that because we're programmed to glorify this flesh. You don't see that in any other critter that God ever created. You don't. You know, have you ever thought about that or is your pet hamster trying to keep up with the joneses i mean you know is your does your dog say well my dog house is bigger than his so i'm much more i'm much more of an important dog than that than he is no you don't see that only in mankind because none of the other the creation was programmed to be exalted they were not programmed to be glorified in mankind you're going to disagree with this Mankind is. I didn't hear a single amen. I can tell you disagree, and I love it. I love it when you disagree because I get to prove you wrong. Mankind was created to be exalted. Say, okay, pastor. I don't believe a word of that. You're like, that goes against everything I've ever been taught. I'm going to prove it to you here in a little bit. And no, I'm not going on TV uh, talking about, you know, sow your $58 seed and God's going to elevate you. No, that's not what I'm talking about. John chapter 7, 17, I'm sorry. St. John 17. I know John is in here too somewhere. We're going to do a little bit of reading. And I'm going to prove you all wrong. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with your own self 
with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested your name unto men. Has he manifested his name unto you? Say, he's manifested his name to me. I manifested your name unto men, which you gave me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gave them to me, and have kept, and I have kept your word, and have, they have kept your word. I'm sorry. Now they, can you say they have kept your word? That's very, very important right there. They have kept your word. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Without that, the whole deal's off. We have to keep his word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours. All mine are thine. And thine are mine. And I am glorified. I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. These people that have kept your word. They are in the world, and I am come to you. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those when thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that thou gave me, I have kept And none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to you. And these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Aren't you thankful for that, that he has the power to keep us from the evil? They that are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, sanctify them through your truth. Thy word is truth. You can't be sanctified without his word. As you have sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world and for their sakes I sanctify myself that I might also be sanctified through the truth neither pray I for these alone but for them for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they may be one as excuse me they may be one can you say one as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given to them. Said the glory that you've given to me, I have given it to them. So that we can all the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that lives right here, we can all be one. You ask, are you a oneness preacher? Oh, yes, I am. I believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one. And you know what's even better than that? If you got the Holy Ghost, you're one. You're becoming one. Whenever you get married... The whole goal is that you become one flesh. Whenever you get married to Jesus, you take on his name and you begin to become one with God. That's why. That is why. I just proved to you that you are made to be glorified. 
If you want to be glorified, and you all do, <laughs> how do I know you want to be glorified? Because you were programmed that way. You may say, no, no, I'm, but you really, down deep inside, there's a part of you that wants to be glorified. And that's okay. But now you must keep his word. If you're going to be glorified, you must keep his word. And what does his word say? And I know I'm reading a lot of scripture this morning, but I'm just letting the Bible preach itself. Matthew chapter 23. We need to find out what does his word say. If we want to be glorified, and you can say you don't, but let me tell you something. I want to be glorified. I don't care about the glory that's on this earth. I don't care about uh, having a big car and a big house and a whatever. I don't care a thing about that. I don't care about having a, a nicer anything than you. That's not what it's about. But let me tell you something. Whenever I meet Jesus in the air, that's what I live for. I want to be glorified on that day. Whatever day that is, I want to receive the glory that he has for me. So how do we do that? How do we receive the glory that God has made, has designed, that he has stored up for us? It's very important for us to know. Matthew chapter 3, verse 23, I'm sorry, verse 10 says, Neither ye be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. But he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So if you will humble yourself, you know, I, I, uh, I used to teach Sunday school for 27 years, and I I often ask a new class when I got them, I say, how many of you would like God for you to humble you? And they'd all raise their hands and I'd say, not me. When God does the humbling, whew, it can be painful. I want to humble myself. There's only two types of people in this world, the humble and those that are about to be. And I want to do the humbling myself. I, wanna, I, I, I don't want to try to exalt myself because it is impossible. You can have everything in the whole world, and it is nothing if you don't humble yourself. James chapter 4, verse 10. Whosoever shall exalt, I'm sorry, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You want to be exalted? You humble yourself, and he will do the lifting. You bring yourself low, and he will do the lifting for you. You won't have to build a reputation that says, oh, this person here, they're fantastic. You won't have to do that because God will do it for you. Whenever you walk down the street, people will point you out and say, that man right there is different. That woman right there, they are different. There's something that makes them different. What is it that makes you different? It's that glory that he's shining through you. It's that glory that he's giving to you day in and day out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Wait a second, back that up. I must have misread that. Did it say there that, um, that God is really thankful that I chose to accept him? That God is really, really proud, excited that I chose to accept him? No, it says... I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. That is your reasonable service. Go on. Go on to the next. Okay, I guess not. 
Um, And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is for us to live as a sacrifice. Let me tell you something. Sacrifice is never easy. Sacrifice is never painless. You understand what sacrifice is? Before Jesus, whenever Jesus gave his sacrifice, he stretched himself on a cross. They nailed nails in his hands and his feet, spikes. They drove a spear into his side. They put a crown of thorns on his head and his, his visage was marred. He was beaten. He was bruised for us. That's what sacrifice looks like. And you can say, well, I'm going to live as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Let me tell you something, boys and girls, it ain't easy. Sacrifice is sacrifice. But sacrifice, humbling yourself. He, Jesus Christ, God manifested in flesh, humbled himself unto death. Even the death of the cross. To be glorified, you must be given as a sacrifice. What does that mean to us? I'm going to bring it down to our level. It means that when people revile you and hate you and say all men are of evil against you for his name's sake just because you're trying to live right, that you should rejoice. That means that I'm going to give up that overtime that I could have made on Sunday. That's time and a half, man. That's big money. That'll go a long way. I'm, gonna, I'm choosing to give that up. I'm choosing to give up that job that keeps me away from my church family on Sunday. Even to make less money, at least it seems that way, I'll guarantee you anything you give to God, he's going to give back to you in spades. Amen. Amen. He will not be outgiven. Just talking about giving, you know, and, and I was talking to somebody this morning about giving. You're not going to outgive him, but you know what? I, I've, I've been blessed financially and I've been broke financially, but you know what I believe? Whenever I was broke, and I mean broke, I believe that it was a test I believe that it was an opportunity for me to, for God to say, am I going to get to show my glory in him? Is he going to be faithful even when he's broke? Will I get to still shine some light of glory into Jim's life when he's broke? Will he still be faithful? And my question to you is, you, will you? And I really don't buy the whole thing about for those who have to give and those who have not. If you got 10 french fries, one of them belongs to God. Matter of fact, they all do. It's all God's money. He, every dime I've ever received, I got it directly from him because he's got all the gold and all the silver. Everything upon the earth belongs to him. And he lets me keep 90% of it. What a deal. And then he goes beyond that. He blesses it because we gave the first fruits. So if you have not to give, you never will. I'm just saying. Likely that you never will have enough to give. But if you will sacrificially give when you don't have, God will see to it that you have enough. And that's all I'm saying about that. It's what sacrifice looks like is they won't invite me to the party because they know that I won't do the drugs and the alcohol and all the other things that they're doing at that party. I really want to go to that. I'd really love to see those popular people, but they shun me because of what I won't do. It's whenever your boyfriend or your girlfriend breaks up with you because as the Lord liveth, I will not. It's 
It's whenever you pay the price for doing the right thing, but you keep doing the right thing anyway. And let me tell you something. There's always a price to be paid for doing the right thing. Always. Whenever it says no good deed ever goes unpunished, that is a true statement. But it's being punished and continuing to do the good thing, to do the right thing over and over and over. What are you doing? You're allowing God to shine his glory, the glory that he wants to give you into your life. Whenever you see people doing these things, and you can stand with me, I'm almost done. When you see people living as a living sacrifice, it's allowing them to see the glory of God in your life. When people see it, you know, when, when, if God were to appear right now in his glory, it would kill us all. But there's a type of glory, there's a side of God's glory that people can see. And it doesn't kill them. As a matter of fact, it will bring them to life. And the glory that people are going to see, the glory of God that people are going to see are going to be in you and me. Because his spirit lives right in here. And we're living that daily sacrifice. It's not a one-time sacrifice. It's not, it's not something I decided to do 40 years ago. It's a daily sacrifice. Before you, your feet hit the carpet, you've decided I'm giving my will over to him. Not my will, but thine be done. Before the greatest sacrifice that was ever given in the history of mankind, the only sacrifice that could wash us free of our sins, Jesus knelt in Gethsemane and he said, Father, this cup is too great. If it be your will to let it pass from me, I don't want to drink all these sins. I've not ever tasted of sin and I'm going to be, I'm going to become sin. Father, if it be your will, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If God is going to show his glory in our life, it's got to be his will and not our own. It's only whenever we are tried in the fire that we can come forth as purest gold. Romans chapter 8. Man, I want you to really listen to this. This is, this is some beautiful, beautiful stuff right here. Romans chapter 8. In verse 14. It says, For as many as are led up by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witnesses, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, if we suffer with him here, if we choose to suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If you choose to suffer with Christ, if you choose a life of sacrifice, we will be glorified together. And you know what? His glory will start shining in you long before the rapture. His glory will start shining on you. Every day people will notice there's something shining about that person. There's something coming through. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is that spirit. Can you say that spirit? And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord.
Romans 8 says this. This is written on my grandmother's tombstone. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If we allow His Spirit to glory in our flesh, if we lift Him up, if we abase ourselves and lift Him up in our flesh, it glorifies Him. You see, God doesn't need silver. He doesn't need gold. God doesn't need a a, a fancy car. God doesn't need to glorify Himself. He's already glorified. But you say, well, how... Where do I fit into the equation? Why am I even important at all? The greatest glory that God has. I believe the greatest glory, whenever he looks down upon us and sees his glory in our sufferings. He sees it that Ashton's going to be faithful in the good times, faithful in the bad times. That Luke is going to do the right thing even when it's the hard thing. I want to I want to go to heaven. Can you say amen? But I want to glorify God here. And I fall so short. I fall so short and so do you. I I was talking to a friend yesterday and he said, I just want to do better. I want to do better. I want to do better in my flesh. Whenever God looks at us, what does he see? Does he see his glory shining through in your life? I want to do better. I want to do better bad enough to come and sacrifice myself at these altars. I'm opening up the altars right now. If you want to do better, if you want God to be glorified in your life here on earth, if you want to abase yourself, there's no better way than on your knees. If you want to humble yourself, there's no better way than asking for His mercy. If you want to give over your will to His, He is here today. I would bid you come. I would bid you come if you really want to be different. If you really want to be better. I'm going to go to this altar and sacrifice my will. I challenge you to do the same.
amiss if I didn't ask someone today. On the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the place where they were sitting. Cloven tongues like as a fire set up on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. After this, Peter preached a sermon and he was asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? He held the keys to the kingdom. No other man held the keys to the kingdom. Peter held them. And he said, repent, turn away from your sin. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the washing away of your sins. And you shall also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And God is calling you right now. If you have not ever had that experience, if you've never been washed in His blood and sanctified by His Spirit, He's calling you today. God bless you, you're dismissed.